Hello, good evening. I see uh, Dr. Alita has joined in. Uh, hello, Dr. Tam Patushara, good evening, President Dr. Emsa. So, uh, your, your mic is muted, Dr. Alita. Okay, can All we hear right. now? No? Shall, we, shall we start? Yes. You are ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, your mic is muted. No, no. Oh. Yeah, uh, mic is okay I, I, now. I, I, we can hear. Okay. We can hear. Yes. Are we ready, Buddhi? Shall we start? Right. Yes. Sir. So, uh, good evening, everybody. So, uh, on um, behalf of PEMSA, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, one of the very senior alumnus of uh, Peradhan Medical School Alumni Association. Uh, Dr. Lalita, Lalita Senrat. She is uh, from the 82-83 batch. So um, we have students and we all are fortunate to uh, get the expertise of uh, uh, our, our alumnus. So welcome uh, uh, Dr. Lalita on, on behalf you. of uh, PEMSA. So Dr. Lalita is a consultant of ophthalmologist uh, teaching hospital Karapit here. And uh, she is a chairperson of Glaucoma Interest Group of College of uh, Ophthalmologists of uh, Sri Lanka. And she's a focal uh, point Glaucoma Vision 2020 and past president of uh, Ophthalmologists of Sri Lanka. So she's a uh, very senior um, uh, ophthalmologist uh, in Sri Lanka. So we are proud and we are quite happy that you have um, agreed to join us. Thank so, uh, without much ado, so let me uh, invite uh, Dr. Lalita to uh, start the talk. Yes, today. You can, because we are late. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. Uh, and uh, just I'm so happy to share my knowledge with the Peradhania uh, undergraduates. Actually, I'm so glad uh, for the invitation. Um, we and don't I, hear I you, Dr. Okay. Why? Can't you hear me? No, audio is clear. Audio is clear. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, uh, we are good, Dr. Alita. All right, yes, you can, can hear, yes, no? Yes, Everybody yes, can, can hear, can hear. Okay, All right. Uh, then I'm so glad because I'm very much thankful to Dr. Jayalat also, my batchmate and my very good friend for just giving me the opportunity introducing me to you. Actually, it's a very uh, good opportunity to share my knowledge with you. Yes, I'm sharing my screen. And uh, just today, I'm going to talk on eye science. Please interrupt me if you can't hear or is there something going wrong, right? Okay, eye science of systemic diseases and neuroophthalmological problems, common problems we have come across day to day practice. Because most of the 80% of systemic diseases can be diagnosed through the small window of the eye, like that means pupil of the eye, as well as a lot of systemic Excuse me, diseases. madam. Sorry. Excuse Can't you hear? Sorry, madam, have you, shared this? have you shared the screen, madam? Uh, it's not. Just wait for, wait for a minute. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. We can't see the shared screen, madam. Okay. Just give me a second. Uh, oh, right. Can you see now? Can you? Ah, uh, yes, madam. Yeah, now it's can see, madam. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, today, just, uh, as I told just today, I'm going to discuss the problems which most of the systemic diseases come out of the, uh, through the eye and a uh, lot of eye clinical science come out with the systemic diseases. First of all, I just bring the normal anatomy of the eye, retina and the visual Actually, I'm not going to into details because we are learning as uh, in a second MB and you have to refresh your H 
systemic infections there are many many other uh, undergraduates the non infectious common cause diabetes and thyroid are very most commonly affect the eye and the connective tissue diseases like rheumatoid arthritis nodosa and systemic sclerosis there are many many connective tissue disorders are uh, having a uh, ocular uh, symptom is also a very common cause of uveitis and conjunctivitis and there are vascular diseases like giant cell arthritis the inflammatory arthritis which cause sudden loss of vision due to optic neuropathy and the sarcoidosis vicious disease vkh and phacomatosis just remind these names and if you see a patient while you are in a medical ward just keep in your mind these patients can be present with eye signs and symptoms which sometimes may be a acute visual loss just i these are the, i just brief you out the common eye dis- diseases associated with the endocrine problems the thyroid eye disease this is one of the most common disease with eye signs if you see a patient with asymmetric or symmetric protrusion of the eye proptosis your first diagnosis should be a thyroid eye disease it can be affect the soft tissues of the eye periorbital tissue and it can affect the lid and it can affect the muscles as well as it can affect the optic nerve by compression of the swollen soft tissue surrounding optic nerve these are at the acute stage it's very sometimes they may present with red eye chemosis that means swollen conjunctiva like bulgy and well as episcleritis and sometimes severe dry eye they present to us with acute red eye that cro- chronic long term diseases could present with like a lid retraction and sometimes there may be a proptosis protrusion of the eye if you see the spiral show above the cornea superior cornea about 12 o'clock that means the patient may have a lid retraction or proptosis and it also they uh, shows the lid lag the lid is moving downwards with the globe which smooths downward when you are looking at down this but in thyroid eye disease the lid is not coming smoothly with the globe and it's just lagging behind that you got lid retraction those are very common i think for the medical cases also this is so important for these signs there's a thyroid eye disease this is a non inflammatory changes of the eye and it also affect the extracellular muscles which cause swollen and tensed up uh, extracellular muscles sometimes it fibrosis and cause limitation of the extracellular movements and it also cause proptosis protrusion of the eye uh, which may cause exposure keratopathy and it also produce uh corrective force retinal changes and optic swelling because of the compressive optic neuropathy the optic neuropathy if it is caused by thyroid ophthalmopathy it may cause sometimes visual impairment relative afferent visual field defects and a visual field abnormalities therefore if the patient has a severe proptosis and thyroid eye disease you have to think about the compressive optic neuropathy which may uh, end up with blindness and you have to prevent them going blindness by imme- early intervention the restrictive myopathy is as i told you is this limitation of the movement of the eye and limitation of the movement of the eyelid that's a restriction there's a tethering of the extra ocular muscles that is not the nerve pulses there's a muscles which contraction and relaxations not happening from uveitis i i told you there's lot of systemic inflammatory conditions may cause uveitis that's a inflammation of the uveal tissue as well therefore lot of systemic diseases may present with uveitis it is an inflammation of the uveal 
tissue, I, as I said, iris, ciliary body, and the choroid. The, the symptoms of uveitis you should know is an acute, painful red eye. That's one, one of the causes of red eye. Blurring of vision. If there's a uveitis, there may be blurring of vision. The patient may see some floaters, like dot, dots and like uh, tea dust, like tea dust thing in uh, front of their eyes in the visual field, floaters. And sometimes they may impairment of the vision in a severe case. And these patients may associate it with other systemic features of inflammatory disease of the other systemic organs, especially musculoskeletal system. The signs are the redness is more around the cornea and cornea may be a bit hazy and there may be anti-chamber reaction and there may be sometimes the cells and debris collect within the anterior chamber you put hypopian and there may be a posterior sinica that means inflammatory iris attached to the lens. And there may be a cataract in long standing cases. And the inflammation of the posterior part of the eye that you called vitrea, vitreous gel within the cavity, posterior cavity of the eye, we call vitreous. And inflammation of the vitreous also a sign of uh, chronic systemic inflammatory disease. And retinochoriditis, that means there are multiple inflammatory, uh, single or multiple lesions in the retina and the choroid. The common causes are the inflammatory seronegative arthritis, junior correct arthritis. These things remember very carefully because if you have a patient with these uh, uh, diseases in a medical ward or any rheumatological ward, you have to refer them for their eye checkup. Especially junior chronic arthritis, they are asymptomatic and you have to diagnose by clinical examination only. And they may cause blinding complications. Mm -hmm. And also connected to tissue disorders, <coughs> sarcoidosis, and vicious. The systemic infections also cause the similar way, as I told you, this toxoplasma, CME, tuberculosis, herpes ophthalmicus, syphilis, leprosy, candida, and herpes simplex virus, and HIV. This is how a patient presents with acute red dye with uveitis. You can see the redness is more around the cornea, right? This is a corneal injection. And the pupil is irregular because there's additions of the pupil into the lens. <coughs> and there, there may be a bit corneal edema and lustless cornea. See, <coughs> there are other features. These are the anterior uveitis, that means inflammation of the anterior chamber with some additions and granulomas on the iris as well as additions with the lens. And you can see there's a hypopian. I said there's a hypopian inflammatory cells and debris collects within the anterior chamber and sediment. And you can't see the details of the uh, iris because of the inflammatory inflammation going on in the aqueous humor. And this is the acute anterior uveitis. I said the retinochoriditis, while you are looking at the fundus with the detailed examination, you may see this uh, like a tiny, tiny whitish, fogging, inflammatory patches all over. It may be uh, continuous or it may be multifocal patches. These multifocal patches are more in fear of tuberculosis like lesions. Therefore, in sarcoidosis, you should know the lung lesions are occur in 95% of cases, thoracic lymph nodes 50% cases, skin lesions 30, and the eye signs in 30. All sarcoid patients, one third of them may have eye complications. Therefore, not even in the UVITIS, they may have a conjunctive granuloma, they may have lacrimal gland involvement and end up with dry eyes, and also they may have typical mutton fat KPs in the entry chamber. These are other features. I'm not going into detail sarcoidosis. And we'll go move into the rheumatoid arthritis. It's a very common uh, disease entity in a systemic uh, medical wards as well as in a rheumatological uh, section. Actually, they may 
come with acute red eye because of the inflammation of the sclera. That's a collagen. So rheumatoid arthritis is a collagen vascular disease and inflammation of the connective tissues. Therefore, sclera is a connective tissue. It causes inflammation of the sclera. It may be necrotizing or non-necrotizing. That means if some um, scleritis with the thin out the sclera and you can't see the choroid underneath and globe or alter the shape. And it also causes the inflammation of the cornea, peripheral of the cornea, just closer to the limbus because limbus is a vascularized tissue and these vessels cause inflammatory cells just invading into the cornea and cause inflammation of the periphery of the cornea and patient may end up with blindness that you call marginal keratitis, peripheral ulcerative keratitis. Then there's another entity, a whole entity, the neurofibromatosis. There are many, many eye signs. You know the neurofibromatosis, the phacomatosis. There are three types of phacomatosis. One thing is neurofibromatosis. What are the neuro, uh, eye signs of neurofibromatosis? They may have a plexiform neurofibroma or nodular neurofibroma. And anterior segment, you can see there are whitish, yellow, white nodules over the iris. And you may see a prominent corneal nerves, but it has to be examined under sit lab. But make sure the neurofibromatosis cases should be referred to eye unit for further evaluation of eye disease. And they are at high risk for glaucoma. Also, they may have a choroidal hematoma like in the skin. And they may also end up with cataract. In orbit involvement, the neurofibroma may can cause optic nerve glioma, sphenoorbital encephalocele. Therefore, they may end up with blindness too. These are the plexiform neurofibroma. Because of the ptosis, they may have a poor vision due to mechanical ptosis. These are the leash nodules, but in white people, it can, see, it can be seen very clearly, but in our dark eyed disc, it is very difficult to see, but until you have an experience. Then you may have choroidal hematomas, choroidal nemus, and these are the retinal astrocytomas, retinal changes. They may develop cataract like this, these things, and sometimes this kind of hematomas. The optic nerve glioma is one of the common cause of blindness, and uh, so therefore you have to do a MRI to evaluate the optic nerve glioma. It has invaded into the anterior cranial fossa in here. This is the optic nerve glioma, which just spread into the anterior fossa which tra travels up to the chiasm. The sturge weber syndrome, you must have heard about that. sturge weber syndrome is a, uh, has a three features. Uh, Episcleral hemangioma, there's a, a nevi, <coughs> mental retardation, and the nevus flamius of the skin and facial hypertrophy. Therefore, the ocular features are episcleral hemangioma, the eye involvement and the choroidal hemangioma due to ocular retinal involvement, they may have a high risk for glaucoma and they may have a nevious flamius or over the skin and they may have facial hypertrophy. It usually happens in one side of the face. See, these are the signs and they may have the intracranial hemangiomas which may uh, come, come out as a epilepsy or any uh, neurological diseases, actually neurological signs, they may present with neurological signs because of the parietal anywhere, the hemangioma in the brain. Therefore, these patients are at high risk for glaucoma. See these, these patients, how do you diagnose these patients' glaucoma? Because this eye is larger and enlarged cornea, asymmetrical cornea, and this eye has a hemangioma, it's a nervous flamius, and this is the patient's Sturge Weber syndrome. Here the patient's having a glaucoma, right? Then the tuberous sclerosis, a phacomatosis is due to mental handicap, epilepsy, and adenoma sebacum trial. The adenoma sebacum, you know, there's a uh, hypertrophy of the uh, sebaceous glands, and as she spots, caffeole spots, 
shelvin patches and skin tags those are the skin features of uh, sturgibus sorry tuberous sclerosis the ocular lesions are retinal astrocytomas <coughs> Hypopigmented iris spots like in a neurofibromatosis and visceral hematomas can involve in brain, kidney. Right. These are the adenomas which involves in the, especially involves in the nose and the cheek. These are the ash leaf spots, it's mostly seen with the wooden light. And these are the shagreen patches, the hypertrophy thin, thick skin. Or oh, in uh, the, the distribution of the nerve area, it's like a linear uh, patches, chagrin patches, commonly seen in the posterior lumbar region. <coughs> First, back. Astrocytic cerebral hematomas can occur. You can see this <coughs> periventricular astrocytomas common in small toe, uh, the, the little toe. You have to just check this is subangle hematoma is mostly patho like a pathognomonic feature of tuberous sclerosis. These are the retinal hematomas. Actually, this if you if you see the fundus, if you see this type of lesions, actually it's mimics retinoblastoma, but <clears throat> these are the tuberous sclerosis. The herpes soft ophthalmicus is one of the common diseases which come across in our life, which everybody should see the herpes soft ophthalmicus. But the important is herpes zoster of thalmicus involving in this, the nose, tip of the nose. If there's a blisters and the ulcers involving tip of the nose, that means this involvement of the external nasal branch of the nasociliary nerve. Therefore, if this is, you call Hutchinson sign. The, if uh, the Hutchinson sign is positive, that's the nasociliary branch surprise the eye. And there may be an ocular complication for long term. Therefore, if you see this sign, you have to definitely refer to an ophthalmologist to eye clinic to make the patients patients to be follow, followed up at least for two years to exclude any ocular involvement. It may cause from the cornea conjunctiva up to the retina. There are many, many complications can occur. As I said, lid ulcers and scarring, trichiasis and corneal Ulceration and stretching, cryptoconjunctivitis, corneal ulcers, viral ulcers, stromal keratitis, scleritis, uveitis, glaucoma, and retinochoriasis. From conjunctiva up to all the structures could be involved in herpes zoster of thalmicus. That's why it is very important if you see a herpes zoster of thalmicus patient, definitely need a referral to an eye unit or an ophthalmologist for uh, follow-up and further treatment. Otherwise, otherwise, if you see this type of ridge scarring, it scratches the cornea, even without involving the eye, it scratches the cornea for ulceration. They may lose the cornea sensation also, and they may form a dendritic type of ulcers. These are the retinopathies. And sometimes they may end up with ocular motor nerve palsies, involvement of the ciliary ganglion of the Orbit. Tuberculosis is one of the other very common cause of uh, systemic disease which causing eye problems. My first thing is uh, anterioritis. If a patient comes with bilateral, both are involving uveitis, definitely you, you, you have to suspect top of your different di differential diagnosis, tuberculosis should be investigated and they may cause anterioritis. Choroiditis, as I told you, there's a choroiditis and vasculitis in involvement of the vessels and the involvement of the optic nerve head and optic nerve head edema, the papillitis or optic neuropathy and multiple miliary tuberculosis. The toxoplasma, I'm not going into detail. There's a very common entity which present with uh, eye signs sometimes may end up with blindness. These are the toxoplasma active information. It's the retinochoroiditis involvement of the retina as well as choroid because of the deposition of the parasite in the choroid. And it's called inflammation and uveitis and sometimes leaving a large scar. If it is within the macula, patient may lose vision. It may be a congenital toxoplasmosis while it's catched during intrauterine life or it may be in late in life. 
If it is happens in congenital toxoplasmosis, patients may present with pain or poor vision without their knowledge. But while you are examining the patient, you may find this a punched out scar within the eye without any activity, and that is the congenital toxoplasmosis. The diabetic and the eye. The diabetic is a very common <coughs> in our country, in our elderly or population. Uh, working age uh, population, actually diabetic uh, is present in one in four patients. I don't know actually, actually I, to my knowledge that I think there's a 25% of patients are people are diabetic. Therefore, diabetic may cause senile cataract, right? Pre-senile cataract. <clears throat> the cataract's commonest cause is age, but in diabetic patients at any time, they can get cataract, even in a small children then they may have a high prevalence for glaucoma because there's a vascular attenuation and they may cause optic neuropathy. And they, the most serious and blinding complication is the diabetic retinopathy. Actually, diabetic retinopathy is a serious thing. But if the patient comes with symptoms, they are too late. You can't recover. You can't reverse. Therefore, you have to Identify the diabetic retinopathy at early age before they get getting symptoms and you have to treat them. Therefore, it's a, it is the commonest cause of blindness in the working age group. There is no cure rather than prevention of blindness and control at its early stage. These are the completion cataract, glaucoma, they lose the peripheral vision. And they may have a diabetic retinopathy. They, you can't see some areas. <coughs> and retinal vascular occlusion is a very common. Central retinal vein occlusion, branch retinal vein occlusion are very common in diabetic patients. And neurological palsies, because this is mononeuropathy, mononeuropathy are one of the common problems in diabetic uh, vasculopathies. And endophthalmitis, sometimes endogenous endophthalmitis. Recently, I also I got a case with uh, the reverend was unruly controlled diabetes that came with bilateral endogenous endophthalmitis because of their and he is undergoing dial, repeated dialysis. These are the stages. Actually, you should all of you should aware what are the what is the diabetic retinopathy because at your practice when you are becoming a medical officer. You should see this when you are doing the endoscopy with the ophthalmoscope. You should be able to detect these signs. <clears throat> right? There, these are the microaneurysms and hard exudates at very early stage. Right? There, there are tiny microaneurysms, only no leaking, but there are tiny microaneurysms. But image is so too small, you may not be able to see tiny, tiny microaneurysms. Here, the, the microaneurysm starts leaking and deposits. The plasma, which in the in sub hard exudates, these are the large leaking points involved in the maculator. This is the macula. This is the macula, which has the most sensitive to the <coughs> area of the eye, which gives the good visual acuity. If you damage these areas, we may lose vision. And this is the extensive damage to the macula. And sometimes, then, proliferative stage comes, the ischemic damage uh, uh, causes proliferation of the abnormal blood vessels that you called neovascular new vessels. They are so fragile and all it's very ready to break. And it ends up with pre-retinal hemorrhage and pre uh, subhyaloid hemorrhage. And these new vessels ultimately end up with fibrosis and scarring and retinal detachment. This is so serious. <clears throat> but Diagnosing at these two stages, we can prevent them blindness. But at this stage, from here onwards, if you detect, we can't reverse the disease and patient may have a residual visual impairment and blindness and we can stop the disease, but you can't reverse the visual vision back. <clears throat> this is the uh, visual path, as I told you. There's a retina, optic nerve, chiasma. Uh, optic tract and uh, lateral genuclear body, optic radiation, which radiation goes in the parietal and the temporal lobe and ends up with the calcarean sulcus of the uh, occipital cortex. Then you think eye starts from the most anterior part of the brain and ends up at the 
posterior part of the brain. That means the most of the neurological <clears throat> diseases may have some kind of eye problem, eye signs. Therefore, so important. That's why we have a neuro-ophthalmology because most of the cranial neurological problems just <clears throat> uh, project an eye signs and symptoms. Then first thing, what are the clinical examinations? You have to make sure about the, the optic nerve and beyond. The, you have to check the visual acuity. Usually they have a scotoma. They can see some areas and they may have a color vision, diminution of the <coughs> color. It's a red color. They see as a little bit of dimmer. And the visual fields becomes, <coughs> central visual fields becomes uh, constricted. <coughs> And they may have a relative afferent pupillary defect. <clears throat> All of you as a medical student should know how to detect the relative afferent pupillary defect or afferent pupillary defect or efferent pupillary defect. <clears throat> efferent pupillary defect, you may kill a patient because you are missing the diagnosis. The afferent pupillary defect is a compressive sign of optic nerve and the efferent pupillary defect is one sign of the surgical third nerve pause. There's a compressive third nerve pause. It may be an aneurysm of the uh, com uh, posterior communicating artery or any SOL which may cause herniation of the uncus compressing the third nerve. Therefore, if you miss the efferent pupillary defect, asymmetric pupil or afferent pupillary defect. Sometimes patient may and may die because of your misdiagnosis. Therefore, you should learn this while you are just doing the appointment. Actually, I can't show and teach. This uh, direct pupil is uh, this pupil is constricting, but when you're coming to the other eye, afferent uh, damaged eye is starting again dilating. Actually, this should be learned during the appointment. And this is the afferent pupil defect, relative afferent pupil defect. And then ultimately end up with visual field loss. They may have a color desaturation. They may have impaired brightness and sensitivity. You can compare both sides, the brightness of the light. And they may have poor contrast sensitivity and visual field defect. Those are the signs of optic nerve uh, uh, disease, optic nerve diseases. And also, you should be able to examine the visual field. Visual field, up to a chiasm, they have a unilateral visual field defect. It's maybe at like it's obeys the horizontal meridian. See, the optic nerve diseases obeys the horizontal uh, visual horizontal line, right? And if this field is this horizontally divided, that is a, that means optic nerve disease. It may have a central circus scotoma. This is actually a damage to the optic nerve itself. And if obeys the vertical meridian, that means it's beyond the chiasm. Chiasm and beyond, usually these fibers are crosses. Therefore, it represents the temporal and the nasal half of the retina. And usually it's caused bilateral, uh, it's, it's called hemianopia, which obeys the vertical meridian. That's you have to remember uh, very well because this is a sign of uh, <clears throat> intracranial pathology. Then other thing, if you're looking at the, if there's a relative apparent pupillary defect with a pair disc, when you're looking at the disc uh, with the ophthalmoscope, there may be a pair disc that means optic atrophy. They may have a clear margin and attenuated peripheral bracelets. The traumatic optic neuropathy, it may be caused caused by traumatic neuropathy, retrovalvular neuropathy, compressive lesions, hereditary and toxic. You don't have to remember, but you should know able to just classify the acute loss of vision and this pallor. Then we'll go move into the acute vision loss. Yes, we have been asked, sometimes you may be asked at the exam, <coughs> viva or uh, in your essay paper, how you manage a patient with acute visual loss. Acute vision loss may be painless, 
painful or maybe binocular. Binocular vision loss, usually a hemianopia that you call hemianopia. <laughs> Then vascular painless, which will feel uh, painless, acute vision loss is due to vascular occlusion. That means central retinal artery occlusion, vein occlusion, arterial occlusion, or branch artery occlusion. And there may be a sudden bleeding into the eye, vitreous hemorrhage. There may be retinal detachment, macular hemorrhage, bleeding in top of the in front of the macula, and optic neuritis, inflammation of the optic nerve, and optic neuropathy. This means ischemic insult to the Optic neuropathy or compression optic neuropathy. The painful lesions are optic neuritis, inflammation of the optic nerve, uh, gencil arteritis with acute and arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, and migraine also cause transient visual loss, sometimes lasts for a few minutes, sometimes up to an hour. Then acute angle crochet glaucoma is one cause of the severe painful visual loss. In binocular causes are uh, occipital load in infarction, acute, acute pituitary lesions like uh, pituitary apoplexy and which compressing the optic chiasm. And also due to toxic optic neuropathy like uh, methyl alcohol poisoning also may they to come with acute loss of vision due to toxic and also the anti-TB drugs. It may not be acute, but it may come with loss of vision. And severe papilledema. Papilledema is usually asymptomatic, and but the, without undiagnosed, long-standing severe papilledema ultimately Then how do you diagnose? History. You have to ask the history, whether it is a how long, how many days, uh, is within a few seconds or long-standing. Duration is very, very important. Is the pain is plus or not? How we talk about these are your questions. I'm discussing one of your questions in your essay paper. How you just approach a patient with acute visual loss. And it is uh, there may be a prodromal signs like a flashes and floaters, sometimes scintillating uh, stars like things they can see because of the inflammation of the optic nerve. And you should inquire with the past medical history, right? Hypertension, diabetes, trauma head injury, hyperlipidemia, gencil artery symptoms, and history of headaches for migraine. And so it's very, very important because the patient comes, and this underlying pathology may be a systemic condition. The retinal detachment, actually this is not associated with the systemic disease, actually, but <clears throat> this I'm discussing the acute loss of vision. It's a retina which comes off due to some tears in the retina. It's followed by flashes and floaters. In the patients come to you with the flashes and floaters, you should refer to an eye surgeon to have a good detailed examination of the eye to exclude any retinal tears. The risk factors for retinal detachment, trauma, surgery, high myops, any connective tissue disorders like Marfan syndrome, which has a thin retina and aging with posterior vitreous detachment. It is an uh, ophthalmic emergency need uh, urgent repair. This is the picture of retinal detachment with the ophthalmic examination. The optic neuritis. Optic neuritis is one loss of vision. It's usually unilateral. <clears throat> There's a retrobulb optic neuritis uh, doesn't show any signs. As a uh, disc is normal, but the patient may have relative afferent pupillary defect and visual field. So, uh, may show the centrocycle scotoma or a Altitudinal hemifield loss. This means half of the field loss of base horizontal meridian. And the neuroretinitis is a disc edema and inflamed nerve fiber layer with macular star. It's a differential diagnosis of hypertensive retinopathy <coughs> because some hypertensive retinopathy is a bilateral, but in, in our neuroretinitis alone is usually unilateral. The, what are the etiology? Then if you see a patient with optic neuritis, acute optic neuritis, you have, if a patient is young, you have to suspect the demyelinating disease you call multiple sclerosis. It may be a para-infection. It may be infection like syphilis, herpes, zoster, AIDS, and Lyme disease. And non-infectious causes like sarcoidosis and autoimmune disease. All the, all the medical conditions, the inflammatory conditions may cause 
ऑप्टिक न्यूराइटिस और ऑप्टिक न्यूरोपैथी इस इमिक ऑप्टिक न्यूरोपैथी कैन बी डिवाइडेड इनटू आर्टरिटिक एंड नॉन आर्टरिटिक आर्टरिटिक इस्किमिक न्यूरोपैथी एस आई डिस्कस्ड यू इज विद कॉमन विद जायंट्स एंड आर्टराइटिस बट नॉन आर्टरिटिक इस्किमिक ऑप्टिक न्यूरोपैथी इज वेरी कॉमन इन एल्डरली ड्यू टू वैस्कुलोपैथी दैट्स ऑक्लूजन ऑफ द वेसल्स ड्यू टू स्क्लेरोसिस एंड एंड अप विद इस्किमिक इंसल्ट टू द ऑप्टिक नर्व and occlusion of the short posterior ciliary artery and uh, the common system in disease is diabetes mellitus hyper main first diagnosis age hypertension diabetes hyperlipidosis collagen vascular diseases sudden hypotension sleep apnea and sometimes it's viagra and i think sometimes it may associated with now the covid vaccine vaccination so i have seen Three cases: one is branched retinal artery occlusion, one one is occipital lobe infarction, one is central retinal vein occlusion. These patients came after the injection of uh, COVID anti COVID vaccination. They are painless, sudden loss of vision, moderate to severe visual loss, signs of optic neuritis, paired ischemia. Uh, therefore, uh, if therefore the, the treatment as others, you can give. a systemic um, blood thinning agents like aspirin but it's not really proven but that's what we can can give otherwise we don't have any special treatment but inflammatory thing we are giving a large high doses of methylprednisolone this is how you diagnose this is unilateral or bilateral optic nerve head swelling it may be inflammatory there may be splint hemorrhages and this swelling margins are blurred arteritic uh, anterior ischemic but i am not going into so details actually it's, it's a disease of elderly is so over the age of 70 years of age is they present with this severe prodroma symptoms and they may have a loss of acute loss of vision and should be treated with iv methylprednisolone diabetic papillopathy is a not there's a different kind of thing away from papillopathy so this is inflammation of the optic nerve in diabetic papillopathy you should their vision is not poor uh, their vision is good but when you see the eye and the the disc edema you may it's a differential diagnosis of papilledema lebus hedric optic color papillopathy uh, atrophy and then nutritional optic neuropathy and toxic optic neuropathy the papilla edema all the medical students should be able to diagnose papilla edema with the ophthalmoscope the papilla edema how do you diagnose papilla edema is present to you without any symptoms at its early stage and there may be a severe headache with severe headache with sinister features of raised intracranial pressure it is a bilateral it should be bilateral if you call papilla edema it always bilateral and uh, there may be a raised there should be a raised intracranial pressure usually vision is normal at early stage but the long standing cases with blade uh, they may lose the vision because of the severe disc edema and the ischemia the normal uh, their causes are congenital or acquired uh, aqueduct obstruction uh, of the <coughs> system csf obstruction and collecting csf within the ventricles <coughs> and hydrocephalus uh, sol if there's a sol in the brain meningitis and cerebral edema pseudotema cerebri cerebral venous thrombosis diffuse cerebral edema severe systemic hypertension hyper hyper hypertension and csf tumor oh, and then you should be able all the causes should be excluded uh, when you see the bilateral disc edema see this is the disc edema there may be splint hemorrhage of the obscuring of the vessels and the disc margin dilated then tortuous veins and loss of venous pulsation these are the common signs of papilla edema the later stage it may like a champagne cough capillaries and this becomes pale and capillaries disappears and end up with uh, pale secondary optic atrophy 
these are the clinical features projectile vomiting deterioration of the consciousness level there may have a amyrosis with that transient loss of vision and horizontal diplopia due to transient sixth nerve paralysis and visual impairment in long standing cases the, the risks are hyperemic blurred dysmagin loss of previous venous passage causes of dyskinesia papilledema is bilateral accelerated hypertension right anti optic neuropathy is ischemic inflammatory and infiltrative this is summarizing and pseudoedema is due to anterior optic atrophy and methanol poisoning and intraocular diseases like ocular causes are crv occlusion posterior uveitis posterior scleritis and ocular hyper these are the ocular causes not with the systemic disease people with abnormalities you should know in and out as a medical student these are the afferent pupillary defect relative afferent pupillary defect efferent pupillary defect and anisocoria anisocoria is a asymmetrical size of the pupil which more than 1 mm difference of each eye the clinical anatomy of the pupillary pathway are afferent efferent and autonomic all are just regulate the pupil i'm not going into the depth this these things are the pathway these are the causes of afferent efferent pupillary defect i just discussed earlier right these are the third nerve pathways where it can happen and the autonomic denervation can happen in horner syndrome right as you should the affected pupil is small there may be a mild ptosis the dilated affected pupil is larger in adis pupil is common in post viral ciliary ganglionitis and they may have diminished tendon reflex see horner the affected pupil is small this is acquired horners and there's mild ptosis in congenital horners there's a mild ptosis in smaller pupil comparative to the uh, normal pupil and usually in horners the pupil is dilated with cochlear focus and you have to diagnose with this you have to locate the size with this pre ganglionic or post ganglionic these are the pathways i am not discussing in details the agar robertson pupil is a common cause of intracranial involvement of the pretractal nucleus uh, and its pathway in the posterior commissure is not up to you actually just remember that name just in a neuro uh, it can happen in the intracranial neurosyphilis diabetes mellitus myotonic dystrophy perinos dorsal midbrain syndrome encephalitis and chronic alcoholism it's so all the usual pathology lesions it can from the optic nerve optic chiasm and also the optic chiasm lesions are commonly involved with the pituitary tumors right and final lomas may cause dorsal compression from the above optic nerve and the cavernous sinus disease just compresses the optic chiasm from either side you should know the anatomy either sides each side and the carotid artery aneurysm also has a compressive lesion in the anterior part of the optic chiasm the visual field locate the site of the lesion if this is unilateral loss is up to the chiasm is a bilateral field loss is due to the chiasm because chiasm is crossing the the, the temporal fibers are passing same side <coughs> nasal fibers crosses therefore when it affect the nasal fibers the temporal visual field will be lost by temporal hemianopia occurs in pituitary disease they say homonymous hemianopia means one side right or left homonymous but it may be asymmetrical in anterior pathway disease it may be symmetrical in most posterior pathway defect right it may in the post cortical area uh, posterior cortex there may be a macular sparing and homonymous hemianopia these are the visual field defects can't talk so into detail then the extraocular muscles ocular motor nerve palsy you should know 
ocular motor nerve pulse is starting from the brain stem up to the eye up to the orbit so third nerve pulse fourth nerve pulse can occur and cause uh, incompetent speed here is the incompetent speed and sixth nerve pulse the patient can't move the left eye laterally this is a sixth nerve pulse the seventh nerve pulse and the myasthenia that's not the nerve pulse the myasthenia in all of the myo muscles the myopathies right that also cause stosis and this is the overaction of the muscles hemifacial spasm that means the hyperactivity of the muscles this a uh, brain stem lesions internecine ophthalmia those are the common neuroophthalmic uh, features actually in the brain from out of 12 cranial nerves there are uh, except the first except the first up to the eighth cranial nerve all are inter all have a ocular connection eye connection uh, and also the vagus nerve also has a indirect connection because there's a digital pressure or a injection injection may cause uh, and ocular digital reflex and cause vasovagal attack these are your questions actually a 60 year old female present with a history of sudden loss of vision in one eye right uh, if uh, how do you discuss how do we discuss can anybody answer present with history of sudden loss of vision anybody just just volunteers what are the causes of uh, i just discuss these things in, the, in this lecture what are the causes of loss of vision kokian ban ekena denne there should be interactive hmm No answer. First, we have to uh, divide it whether it is a painful and uh, yes, whether good. it is painless. And uh, yeah. according to that, we can uh, according to that categorization, and we can uh, tell the causes for that. And yeah. Yeah. What are what are the painful visual loss? Actually, you think in. Uh, most important thing painful visual loss it could be a acute angle pressure glaucoma it may be a giant cell arthritis it may be a optic neuritis it may be migraine it may be inflammation infection like end of the sudden they may have a indigenous endothelial sudden loss of vision with inflammation and pain and acute uitis these are the this may be ocular causes as well as optic nerve causes acute painful visual loss the painless visual loss are the mostly in the posterior part of the eye it's in all in the retina vitreous optic nerve and beyond right therefore you have to just categorize like that and if you categorize anatomically if you know the anatomy then very easy if you do not know the subject into the depth you can just work out vitreous hemorrhage retinal hemorrhage submacular hemorrhage macular hole vascular occlusion any vascular occlusion like the optic nerve involvement here the optic nerve involvement optic neuritis and optic neuropathy toxic traumatic any any kind and there's maybe a intracranial pathologies like a malignant papilledema malignant hypertension toxic optic neuropathies compressive optic neuropathies and intracranial uh hemianopias and usually right side visual loss ultimately the patient may have a homonymous right hemianopia therefore in history 
this you have to ask whether this is ocular or whether this is a neurological, right? If it is a painful, you have to make sure this is ocular cause, ocular cause, they may have acute brain that not clear cornea and two chamber may be lustreless. There may be many, many ocular signs with irregular pupil, right? If they have uh, signs of giant cell arthritis, you should ask about the history of giant cell arthritis. And also should inquire the uh, hypertension, diabetes, trauma, head injury, and raised intracranial pressure, tumors, and the history of migraine. Therefore, examination also you have to interfere with the anterior segment, clarity of media, pupil examination, retinal and optic nerve examination, visual field color vision, CNS examination, systemic and CVS examination. All things should be because vascular thing, always look for cardiovascular system examination. If there's any neurological hemianopia, so always think of CNS examination and visual field and color vision in the local case with the unilateral visual loss. Right? You have to, like that, you have to just uh, manage the patient. That, that is how arrived at a diagnosis. Then uh, the other other questions I was just uh, just projected to me by this by USA questions. Outline the management of, uh, sorry, that's acute red dye. Actually, sorry. That is not, uh, uh, this slide comes after the right, I go. A uh, 50 year old farm present with redness and tearing in one eye for three days duration. List the possible cause of these symptoms. Just tell me what are the uh, uh, possible causes of red dye. Give me four or five possible causes of red dye. Can balance powder can? Tell me. Hmm? Common causes of red dye. I have discussed already with the systemic disease. This uh, first thing there may be a red dye due to some foreign body inside the eye. Any small scratch on the eye, corneal aberrations, conjunctal aberrations. You know, the corneal ulcer, infection of the cornea, the toxic conjunctiva is the inflammation of the conjunctiva. There may be allergic reaction of the conjunctiva. These are the uh, fairly common causes of acute red dye. It's also, it's a farmer. There's a farmer present with the red dye and tearing for three days, right? Other one is you have to think of any acute uveitis and anger quotient glaucoma, right? Those signs will... Um, bottom of the list because this is a farmer they have given as a farmer because that means this you have can relate with the agricultural injury the after the management you have to just first you have to uh, note the visual acuity if there's a corneal ulcer it's the most vision threatening condition you have to admit the patient if there's no vision threatening you can manage as outpatient if there's a foreign body remove the foreign body ulcer you have to manage by doing the scraping and direct smear culture, ABST, and start the uh, as a treatment uh, for uh, cyclopagic to reduce the pain, as well as antibiotic spectrum antibiotics as a first line. The toxic and allergic conjunctives, you have to put steroids according to the history. This is how you uh, manage. Then, this, then outline the management of two causes of you have mentioned. Corneal ulcer with the torch, simple paint torch, you can see there's a uh, defect in the cornea and there may be yellowish spot and I saw inflamed around the cornea and there may be hypopain pus collection inside the eye sometimes. And if you stain with the fluorescein, usually if you examine with the blue light, it just appears a green patch. So fluorescein is a yellow dye. But with the blue light, it appears as a green patch, which stains when there's an epithelial damage, damage to the corneal epithelium. The rest is normal, but there's an ulcer stain. Right? How do you manage the corneal ulcer? As I told you, you have to just history. The, what kind of trauma happened? If it is an agricultural trauma, there's more 
favor of fungal infection. But don't forget the bacterial infection. But more for, you have to do a scraping and send for uh, gram stain as well as KOH staining for fungal studies and also culture ABST for everything. And start, the patient have a very severe pain and sometimes the pain may inflame due to the iris and you have to put a type of uh, cyclopegic drugs as well as broad spectrum antibiotics until you get down the uh, culture report. And just treat with broad spectrum antibiotics. Start with very frequently at the beginning and just uh, according to the responses then you can tailor. Then other uh, other entity is uh, other entity is acute anger causal glaucoma. That's a vision threatening condition. Both are vision threatening conditions. Acute anger causal glaucoma you can see present acute red eye, severe pain, vomiting, right? Vomiting, and it may be present within a one day, within a day, or sometimes two or three days. Patient may have mild pain and present with severe attack after three four days. Actually, the cornea is clear, not clear, and the chamber details are not visible. Pupil is semi dilated. Iris is of oval in shape. When you flash the torch, the distance between the cornea to iris is very, very shallow. It's like uh, this cornea and the iris is more uh, close and angle is closed. The patient should be managed in ward, and you have to check the intraocular pressure, right? Then immediately uh, try to may reduce the intraocular pressure and give intravenous manitol and topical uh, anti glaucoma treatment. And just same time, so you have to treat with steroids to relieve the pain and uh, give systemic uh, IOP lowering treatment. And this patient should be followed up, and then you have to win the inflammation settles. Yeah, you have to do a peripheral eye dot top. Shall we go for a few MCQs? What is the brand keratopathy? You have have you be ever seen a band keratopathy? Band keratopathy is common in juvenile chronic arthritis. In a later stage, if they develop, sorry, if they develop uh, uh, chronic uveitis, or it is very common in blind eye with a soft eye, which is un non-functioning eye. What is the band keratopathy common cause? Deposition of what? Anybody? Deposition of what band keratopathy? Shanika? Shanika, can you hear? Shanuka? Right, this is band keratopathy. Right, is a deposition of calcium salt. Right, it's a calcium. We are treating with calcium chelating agent. If this patient uh, corneal ulcer, and before you taking the sample and treating, what is the drug of choice you always indicated? Corticosteroid, cyclopegic, antibiotic, and antifungal. It is the cyclopegic to relieve the pain. But you have the same time you have to treat with broad spectrum antibiotic. Corneal sensations are diminished in what kind of diseases? Herpes simplex, infection, marginal. Herpetic infect, infections, corneal sensation is diminished. Herpes simplex and herpes zoster ophthalmicus. The color of fluorescence staining in <coughs> corneal ulcers, yellow, blue, <coughs> green, royal blue. How do you answer anything? I'm sick of that. I'm This is green in color. Right. That's all. Do you have any questions? Right. Do we have any questions?
Buddhika, are you there? Yes, madam, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, I think, done. And uh, there's no any uh, interaction. No? There's a problem. <laughs> there's no interaction. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. sometimes uh, they are like yeah. that, madam. But uh, uh, I'm sure the class was very helpful. Uh, yeah, because, because uh, they had yeah. uh, they, the students actually requested uh, the classes, so I'm sure that uh, they... right, right, okay. Actually, this is very important because in my appointments, so I'm teaching. They benefited uh, from the it. The problem is the two weeks is not adequate yeah. for ophthalmology. Actually, that's I told that eight percent of systemic diseases associated with eyesight. Therefore, within two weeks. Nobody can learn, actually, for the medical students, it is not really educated. In India, they are laughing. So I went for a conference in India, so, uh, Delhi, but they, they are laughing at us uh, because we are having an undergraduate of terminology appointment for two weeks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, okay. Okay, thank you so much then. Yeah. Anyway, on uh, in the absence of any questions, Madam, thank you very much for uh, taking your uh, uh, valuable time to uh, contribute to the uh, PEMSA evening lecture series. I'm sure everyone benefited a lot from this. Uh, if you don't mind, the recording of the lecture will be uh, placed on the website so that the students can uh, go through it uh, in right, the future right. as well. Okay. Uh, so on behalf of PEMSA, Madam, once again, thank you very much. Uh, for taking Welcome. Time to so more than happy to share with you. Okay. And thank you so much. Okay. Then why not? Thank you, Madam. Good night. Madam Kong. Madam, thank you very much for uh, coordinating and being uh, so supportive in organizing this, Madam. I was not able to uh, listen to the lecture throughout because I'm busy. I'm getting uh, you were really helpful, Madam. Okay, man. Okay, good night, Madam.